Hi everybody, so the Oxford Bell. The Oxford Bell is a non-stop ringing bell that's been ringing since 1840 and it's at Oxford University at the Clarendon Laboratory. It was made by Watkin and Hill, London-based instrument makers, and it was purchased by the Reverend Robert Walker, an experimental philosophy reader. He's actually got a note there that says set up in 1840, and that note still stands. The setting up was verified by his grandson, and a photograph was taken, and it has rung ever since. Despite its perpetual ringing, the bell's actually nearly inaudible. The inner workings are clearly visible through the glass dome, and it consists of a small metal clapper, which is likely brass, and that hangs suspended by a thin silk fibre between two vertical pillars, which are dry piles linked in series. The clapper's pear-shaped because it's worn slightly on one side from striking the bell's edge. On the opposite side, it remains unmarked as it strikes above the lower set edge of the bell. Between the bell's brass terminals at the base of the pillars, the voltage measures around 2 kilovolts, and the clapper draws about 1 nanoamp while oscillating roughly at 2 hertz, twice the expected rate under gravity alone. The oscillations actually vary with weather conditions and slow down in humid weather and occasionally cease due to increased humidity. However, they resume automatically without anybody having to give them a little push. There have been times when the bell was deliberately stopped, but that was mostly due to having to relocate it. The exact composition of the piles is actually unknown, but it's evident that they have an outer layer of sulphur, and that seals the cell and possibly an electrolyte. Similar piles were created by Zamboni and Duluc, and are quite famous consisting mostly of 2,000 pairs of tinfoil discs adhered to zinc sulphur impregnated paper coated on the other side with manganese dioxide. Notable other contributors in the field of dry piles include Jean de Luc, a fellow of the Royal Society, credited as a pioneer in the field, along with the works of people like Merchot, Beran and Zamboni as previously mentioned. Interest was not always confined to inorganic substances and metals and there are accounts of the performance of piles made from slices such as wood, beetroot, radish, all kinds of things. The conviction was that a natural process was involved and this might have led to the use of manganese dioxide which in itself is pretty impressive as a substance which releases oxygen on heating. Zamboni certainly included manganese dioxide in his recipe the dry piles weren't limited to electric bells, they also powered pendulum clocks, and publications from the early 19th century by Ronald and Zamboni detail their applications in other methods. During World War II, the Oxford dry pile played an unexpected role in scientific history as a portable battery. The Admiralty Research Laboratory were working with an infrared telescope using an image converter tube with a lead sulphide cathode, and this was later replaced by lead telluride, but it called for a portable battery of about 3 kilovolts at a very low current. Dr A. Elliot, an Oxford physicist, remembered the dry pile in the Clarendon Laboratory and followed a recipe given by Charles E. Benham in The English Mechanic, February to March 1915, and made quite a few of them that saw military use all the way through the Second World War. They were also used in electrostatic voltmeters and night vision scopes. The Oxford dry pile is still working and shows no signs of exhausting its energy. In fact, it seems more likely that the clapper will wear out before the energy stores are depleted. The exact method of operation is under debate. On whether it's an electrostatic device, so it works just by contact of two dissimilar materials exchanging electrons, or it works just like any other battery via a chemical reaction. And it is an important difference because if it's electrostatic, then of course it is a perpetual device. It will, for all intents and purposes, just last forever. If it's like a normal battery, of course, it's going to last until the reactants run out. Now, somebody did point out that given that the thing has been running for about 170 years or so, and it's about one nanoamp of energy, it takes about one microgram of the reactants to provide that energy. And so, of course, it's got a while to go. Somebody else, however, pointed out that if you get moisture in these batteries to form like electrolyte, it does in fact kill them. So there is a huge debate with stuff at stake as to how this thing actually works. It's actually really, really easy to make. Now essentially it's two materials in contact with each other 
Now, if you put any two materials in contact with each other at the point at which they touch, they will, in fact, transfer electrons. Now, obviously, some materials are better at this than others, and the traditional one uses zinc and manganese dioxide. So you have a layer of zinc foil, a layer of a separator, usually paper, and a layer of manganese dioxide. You slap them all together, and you get a pretty good sample. Pile. Now, we don't have any zinc foil or manganese dioxide, so I'm going to make it with stuff that I have available. And here it is. This is just aluminium foil. It's roofing foil. It's really easy to get hold of. You just go down to the builder's merchant and you'll see it sitting on the shelf and just buy yourself a roll. As you've attached your foil, flip your paper over. Now, I'm going to use my uh, ordinary conductive ink. This is just the non-waterproof stuff. And all you do is paint a layer. So when it's dry, you'll have a bit of paper with some zinc foil on one side and some conductive ink on the other side. And all you have to do then is cut it out. Once you cut it out, you'll get that. Then all you have to do is cut it into roughly 25 millimeter squares. And there we go. If you want a more impressive pile, you need to make a couple of thousand of these. Put them together in one big pile, add an aluminium contact plate and wrap them up with some sellotape. So that is a 100 nanofarad capacitor with an LED light. We wait a few seconds and you should charge the capacitor. Then we can do it again. <laughs> and again. I forgot to mention that a good source of the carbon might be that, which is the electrosmog paint that we keep going on about. It's a graphite paint that's supposed to contain graphene, but it would be a good carbon to use in a device like that, because it is an intriguing device. I mean, it's um, easy to make, but it is a little fiddly. But still, lots of interesting things might be able to be done with something like that. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you very much for watching.